Yes. People. Perfect timing, Michaela. Hey, hey. What up, what up, what up? <laughs> hey, Michaela. Nice to see you. It's wait, an honor. Wait. Oh, look at your candle. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Everything's looking good over there. Fire back there. I'm going to have to turn my fireplace back on. <laughs> Whoa. He has a lot of plants. <laughs> Lots of plants. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're plant people, right? Yeah. Are you waiting? Plant, plant fungus people. <laughs> Were you, oh, look, we got 18 folks. Amazing. So good. Let's see. We got Amy. Dennis is here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dennis Walker, the micropreneur. Oh, my homie. Yeah. Are you in your Speedos, bro? Hopefully. <laughs> Jess Pine, my lovely partner. Aww. Jessica Kaming, all the way from Colorado. Ooh. Rachel Flower. Oh, we were feeling so sad no one was and here. <laughs> there Toinette we go. made it. I spoke to Toinette yesterday. She's over in Connecticut. Thanks for making it. Megan Spence, mm -hmm. that name looks really familiar. Awesome. Maybe everyone can drop in the chat like where they're coming yeah, from. Yeah, that's Maybe. what we're going to What What would you like to do, Michaela? I usually ask, like, drop a name and, you know, where, where you're from, what you're doing, one epic thing that you've done this year. Ooh, that's chat. a good one, one epic thing. But, Michaela, what would you like them to? Um, um, uh, yeah, I'd love to ask where people's ancestors are from. Yeah. So. Like, yeah, where, where are your people from? You know, what neck of the woods, what neck of the world are you? Was your blood from? Where is your people from? I think that gives us a really cool idea for the ancestors that we are hanging out with in the space. Yeah. Well, you and I definitely share some ancestors in Sicily. Oh, Martel yeah. Martello is my... Um, Sicilian side of the family, my mom's side. I'm Alfredo Martello. He'll be 98 March 1st. Wow, that's wonderful. Born in 1925. Woo woo. And um, the north end of Boston and mm -hmm. his parents, Vincenzo and Angelina Martello, emigrated through Ellis Island after Mussolini took down Italy. And they had a sponsor in the north end of um, Boston. Mm. I've ever been there. It's where all the Italians mm. hang out. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, and he was born four four years later in wow. Mass. So it's a gorgeous story. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. Let's see. I'll I'll read what some others have to say. That's a great question. I love that. Yeah. Have, I'm curious where Dennis's ancestors are from. I know a little bit about Dennis, but not like, a lot about his ancestors. In the, the cosmic debris of Galactica. <laughs> White people. <laughs> we got <laughs> Megan Spence, San Tan Valley AZ. Jesse mm -hmm. H. from Washington told me about this. Awesome. Cool. Um, mm -hmm. New Orleans, L LA, Louisiana, not LA, from the 1600s. Wow, that's cool. Pies in Southern Italy, Russo, mm -hmm. and also Ireland, Fitzgerald, Dennis, Walker, white people, Scotland, <laughs> probably. I'm going to say some Germany, some English, Irish, uh, Gadalina, Guiano. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I said your uh, name correctly. Andean Mountains in Colombia. Uh, Amy Steinberg, a lot of she's here. a <laughs> member, Reno, Nevada, Hungary. Um, Rachel Flower, nice to have you here, Rachel. Anglo Saxon, UK. Jessica, hi, Italy. Jean Paul, um, geez. Uh, Merg, Merg, oh, hey, Jean Paul. <laughs> um, so stoked to be here, myself and my partner, Sarah, another Mushimama, Mashimama, tuning in from the North Shore of Kauai. Awesome. My ancestors are from Europe, mm -hmm. Middle East, and Northern Africa, as far back as I can track. Mm -hmm. Same for um, Sarah, Megan, mm -hmm. Norway, Ireland, Denmark, white AF. I love that you guys can really just, you know, 
uh, get into this. This is going to be such a fun conversation with Michaela, uh, Felicia Dawson, Atlanta, Georgia, Birmingham, Inter, Alabama, West mm. Africa, um, yeah. and then Aria Swartz tuning in from the snowy mountains of California. We're in the snowy mountains of California. Mm. I'm in the snowy mountains of California too. <laughs> Tahoe. I wanted to hear you say that. That's where I am. I'm North Lake Tahoe, mm. um, Wash Washu County. Uh, Washu territory, um, as well, and um, Andrea is Truckee. We, we, uh, we like to call Truckee uh, East Marin County now, with all the whiteness that's coming in with their Silicon Valley tech money. It used to be a rough and tough cowboy town back in the day, uh, Truckee, California. So amazing! I'm so happy to have um, Michaela de la Maiko here. Um, sorry, everybody, if you're waiting in the, uh, waiting room, we had some zoom tech, um, challenges, uh, as an old, uh, Israeli friend of mine used to say, uh, like a Swiss watch right on time. So thank you for being on time. Anyone in California, if you weren't on time, you're on time. Cause we're on California time. And it's just kind of like whenever we just show up. So, um, thank you all for being here. We have a really amazing, um, conversation uh, not so planned for you. I have some questions and I have a lovely guest. And uh, this is my first time meeting Michaela. Um, I've obviously seen a lot of your content out there and know of your work. Um, Dennis speaks very highly of you as well in the greater mycelial network out there doing the good work. And um, thank you all for joining. And without further ado, um, we're going to get into some questions. I'm going to introduce Michaela. And uh, if you have questions, questions will come up. Um, if you want to just drop them um, in casually in the chat, uh, actually in the Q&A uh, section, and I'll make some time for questions at the end. And um, Michaela, all questions are welcomed. Yeah, to an extent. absolutely. Just get creative and things <laughs> will come up as we talk and we flow here. And how about, um, it's mid afternoon on a Wednesday. How about we all just mm -hmm. close our eyes and just like drop in real quick to the ground in wherever you are. If you're in the comfort of your own home, your desk, your office, your couch, your car, wherever you might be some deep breaths in through the nose, relax the jaw, sit up straight, get that spine straight so we can just tune in to what we're going to receive today. Maybe the roof of your mouth has your tongue pinned to it. Relax that. And just give yourselves a pat on the back for making time out of your day to educate. And I am going to share my gratitude with you all for being here. And then whenever you're ready, we'll just come back into the Zoom room. Just hang out there for a sec. And my teammate said, drop questions in the chat to everybody when you're ready. Okay, if y'all want to keep hanging out, wherever you're hanging out, that's fine. I'm going to get on with it and introduce Michaela de la Maiko. Michaela de la Maiko was born into a first-generation Italian, Afro-Caribbean, and indigenous Mexican family who lived in unceded Tonva territory, Los Angeles, her education comes from years walking the paths of sacred intimacy work, temple arts, circle keeping, Mexica ceremony, and womb care facilitation, all under the care of teachers and guides. Michaela now practices in occupied Oila in Cumyai territory, San Diego, as a mushroom matriarch. She creates much needed education and spaces for unmet populations in the psychedelic renaissance. Her primary focus is holding community-based circles where people can journey through the dark 
and Mineta to uncover their ancestor codes, explore and rewrite trauma wounds, and make meaning with mushrooms and other earth medicines. And Michaela, did I say kum yai correctly? I know there's a couple pronunciations of that. And koila, if you would like to correct me, please do for everyone else's sake. Sure. Um, so the Inland Empire Territory um, in Southern California here is the Kauia Territory. And that stretches from like San Bernardino to Temecula region. And then we have the Kumeyaay Territory, which is uh, much of the North County, San Diego, down to central San Diego area. Thank you. And I have no shame saying that I was on YouTube um, learning how to pronounce that correctly before I jumped on this. So really thank you. For, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's get in some questions. How's everyone feeling? How are you feeling, Michaela? Good? <laughs> um there's just so much to be grateful for i'm mostly happy to to be rooting back at home i had been traveling from the end of january to mid-february and so i'm just really happy to be back with my family and that was the longest i'd ever spent away from my son who's three now so that mm -hmm. was yeah that was really big for us but he seemed to do really well and we felt like much closer even um yeah just even the last couple of days have been like feeling close again so that's been really sweet and nice and there's a lot to be excited about you know um, lots of things happening so yeah I'm just grateful for my life and I'm grateful for what the entheogens have like allowed me to experience in this life because I did not have such a great experience when I was younger so um yeah just happy to be talking to you and happy to be talking yeah. to these great people here Amazing. And uh, just for when I get into the questions, if there are moms in the audience, let us know. <laughs> I think that's good. I know there's a few moms in there. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So first of all, define your relationship with microdosing. While well, you've spoken to microdosing for broadcast news and Harper's Bazaar and Red Table Talks, you've spoken out about the issues with the concept of the microdosing mom. If you could speak to that, that would be great. <laughs> so I've run some clubhouse rooms called Not a Microdosing Mom, and I think for a particular reason. Um, the microdosing mom is a attempted cultural trope, and I think the cultural trope really limits the scope of what entheogenic parenthood really has to offer and really the way that it is practiced by people that I know and people that have lived on the planet for a lot longer than I have. And the reason I stand up against being a microdosing mom is um, because the assumption with what microdosing is, is a consumptive practice of taking small bits of any substance, entheogenic or otherwise, um, at a sub perceptual dose for a period of time for greater wellness and prosperity of the self. And there's a couple of things that I really feel um, miss the mark as far as what the scope of culturally entheogenic mothers can be and do and who they are. And I think the most pronounced of those issues is the way that the media portrays the microdosing mom as just this <laughs> this particular kind of person that it's the mom that is maintaining all semblances of traditional social structures and is just taking a tiny little bit of medicine and is functioning the same way that mom should function however doing it with a with a bigger smile on their face and and more efficiency and getting the kids to soccer practice and look at the Lulu mem like look at the regular Lulu lemon mom who just so happens to also be eating mushrooms and I think that trope is just so boring and tired and um, I've even seen articles with um, the Harper's Bazaar article say the the title was microdosing moms the new wine mom and i think that really just was despicable and i love the reporter who spoke on it and i know that was not her choice to make but that is what the mass media consciousness really um can relate to is 
the mom is all of the regular things the mom is, except is taking a little bit of mushrooms and nothing is changing and nothing is different. And it's so far from um, what is really happening and what a lot of moms are today in relationship to medicine are medicine women. Like there are people that are not just eating the mushrooms, but they're also cultivating the mushrooms. They're also leading mm. ceremony with the mushrooms. They are also um, teaching their children about entheogens. And so I just feel that this microdosing mom trope is really limiting in the grand scope of things and honestly really belittles the importance of the relationship that moms are discovering with the entheogens. And truthfully, consumption is just one side of it. For me, what this evolution is doing is it, it's helping to rematriate psychedelics, which is so much of what I do stand for. So if I don't stand for the microdosing mom, what do I stand for? I stand for the rematriation of psychedelics, which means that mothers are in leadership positions within the psychedelic movement because mothers are the people that are here to educate, have always been here to educate and also be the providers, the supporters and the change makers within the psychedelic movement. So that's why I'm not with the microdosing mom because it pigeons holds the role mm. of mothers within the psychedelic movement and ignores their real role and the real opportunity that they have to take a tremendous and hold a tremendous amount of power in the space. Thank you. And comparing it to the new wine mom. I know. You know gross. It's, just, it's, it's just very <laughs> limiting. There's a lot more depth there that we could probably spend, you know, another hour speaking about that, that whole comparison. So uh, are mushrooms, fungi different from plants? And do you work with them differently? I think we yes. know the answer, but <laughs> let's hear it from Michaela. Yeah, they are in a different kingdom of organisms. Um, they function and operate very differently. They have a different sensory system. They do not, um, not all fungi, but some fungi and most fungi don't use photosynthesis, um, whereas plants do use photosynthesis. Um, but there are a myriad millions of species, um, hundreds of thousands of different species of, of mushroom and hundreds of thousands of species, millions of species of different plants. And they have comparable um, ways and they have differing ways. And for me, when I, you know, operate in this place with plants, I find that plants um, have a different feature around their constituents um, and aromatics. So for me, plants have a, a sensory based quality. Um, they have volatile oils, for example, that usually mushrooms do not have. And volatile oils and terpenes are what are giving the characteristics of different plant, um, like their benefits and things. And there are different chemicals inside of fungi that are giving them their characteristics. So I am also a folk herbalist. And so I learn from plants by being with them, by hearing stories about them, by spending time with them. And I learned about the mushrooms in the same way. So we can approach folk herbalism and we can actually approach, let me reframe, we can approach entheogens and learning about entheogens from a folk herbalist perspective, which is in experiential learning in learning from elders and learning and not just like, you know, elders that we might not have access to, but elders in the space, even someone like Dennis learning through storytelling, I think is also a really cool approach to um, learning about mushrooms and plants alike. And so I find that although these um, the our non-human relatives are a little bit different we can take similar approaches to learning about both of them and we can use and what i love to is employ like my senses as far as spending time with them so a lot of the people that are microdosing today are just coming in contact with like a capsule or they're just coming in contact with like a gummy bear or something that's like so far removed from their actual form and so what i really like to impress on people is experience mushrooms in a variety of ways that engage your senses and your sensory awareness like smell the mushrooms try them try them wet most people only try them dry you can have access try to try them wet um smell them lay with them bathe with them do all kinds of different things and these are all things that i do with plants so i like to approach them in similar ways <clears throat> but recognize them as 
intrinsically different for a lot of reasons. Yeah, building a relationship with our plant yeah. allies and fung fungal allies. And uh, it just made me think of how you wanted to learn where everyone's ancestors were from, because there is that lost art of storytelling. And our ancestors traditionally would pass down the storytelling and get that um, folk, you know, science or, or folk herbalism down and, and pass down to the next generation. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up because um, there are people that all of a sudden there's like, oh, mushrooms are, are the, it's just the, the new thing, right? It's been around for thousands of years or, or cannabis. It just became legal in California in 2018. And it's like, no, it's been around for thousands of years. So let's start paying attention and being a bit more mindful um, to how we approach these uh, medicines. So thanks for sharing that. And thank you for saying, thank you for saying that, because what the model or the worldview that I'm watching psychedelics kind of move into is this like academic model, this like bachelor's, master's, PhD certification kind of lateral, you know, lateral um, or vertical movement, right? This movement towards specificity. And I think that's great within a medical context and also um who's to say that mushrooms or herbs are strictly medical or like deserve to be pre pressed into that model when yeah. when we educate mothers and f the heads of families you can have access to that level of knowledge at such a folk level that there could be psychedelic literacy in just a few generations if you re if you brought back that continuity of learning at a folk level so i feel like we don't need to make entheogenic knowledge exclusive to people who have access to academia because that really just isn't fair at all well we know how the military industrial academic <laughs> system likes to work so uh it's it's very reductionist in that way and um i think a lot of people that i i know in this zoom room here would agree that uh, there's a lot more to it than just uh, pigeonholing it into a scientific um, reductionary standpoint. So um, really? I think we're, I think we're going to get more into that with the, the questions I have. And the, the next one is um, how can mushrooms aid in families and childcare and what use models do you gravitate towards in your practice? Thank you so much. Um, I, I really find that supporting mothers, supporting family members and caretakers with mental health assists family structures. And a lot of folks that have just come out of a postpartum experience, for example, um, don't have a lot of options as far as um, beneficial earth-based materials in order to address the needs of their changing um their changing chemistry and biology and so for me i really like to approach like the postpartum period for example as a really crucial and critical time to focus and pay attention to the the mental health of the mother the emotional health the physical health um and so it's in that place that i really like to offer or support people with bringing mushrooms into their practices or other entheogens for example um i i find that a lot of the mothers that i do care for have very young children and i'm moving into a phase where my child is now getting a little bit older he's three he's a toddler and so what i'm starting to see um, as a potential model that has been really beautiful is that the people around him and the people that are in our home, um, they have an entheogenic relationship. They have relationship to entheogens. So almost all his caretakers, almost all the people who babysit him are psychedelically literate. They have this concept for um, into you know prepar preparation ceremony integration that is a big part of their lives and so that really changes the way that they approach my child if they have an awareness for um entheogenic practice and recognizing that people are emergent people do not operate within schedules or always linear time um, that we are cyclical beings that we are emergent beings they look at a tantrum and they don't immediately pathologize they uh 
they they allow the needs of the child to inform um, how they need to respond as opposed to what their agenda is being enforced onto the child. So I really see within the care that my son gets um, that entheogens have affected and impacted the way that we're all approaching him. And I think that is a general positive. And so for me, maintaining an entheogenic cadence to our lives, I journey at least four times a year. And that's just on my own personal. I'm usually doing these um, journeys on the solstices and the equinoxes or sometime around. And we have community members that are a part of that. So sometimes we'll be journeying in the home or sometimes we'll be journeying um, somewhere near the home and other, you know, those folks will be coming to our home um, and we'll be integrating in our shared space. My son is present and involved for a lot of these conversations so he sees kind of the cultural remnants and like the um what are the adults doing we are listening he's involved he knows the people that are journeying they are his uncles and his aunties and so i think um you know bringing him in to the cultural landscape in which entheogens are being consumed is also an important part of the family care system. Um, we don't just talk about, oh, mommy just ate mushrooms and like now we're going to go to the farmer's market or whatever. Like that's all fine and good. And I think within the microdosing mom model, um, but a reverence for like ceremony and ritual is something he's already become accustomed to because we include him in those in those experiences and that cultural knowledge is really important i would say sometimes even more important than just us ingesting but the framework for which the ingestion takes place is really important so that has completely augmented his care and my ability to have a piece about myself to be able to have worked through a lot of my triggers and the things that annoy me and the way that I respond to him in my life have been completely helped by not just mushrooms, but also cannabis and also ayahuasca and also peyote and San Pedro. So I'm um, really grateful to know that, you know, LSD and MDMA are parts of my care system for my son, um, because if I'm working through my things, I'm staying connected with his father, I'm staying connected with the community members, we can all really care for him in a better way. So um, collective mental health of all of the caregivers that um, you know, have contact with my son is really important. And that mental health is very much supported by psychedelics and entheogens. I was just writing a note down there, collective mental health, psychedelic literacy. Those are the, the big terms that jumped out at me and then boiling it down. You've sound like you've formed a very amazing community for your son and yourself in the larger context of the people that you trust to be around your son on entheogens. Uh, you mentioned peyote and I'm part of a peyote community here in Northern California. And uh, I've been to two baby blessings um, mm -hmm. for Phil and Demetra and, and Phil is a um, road man as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, in their wedding, uh, while she was eight months pregnant with um, Cyprus and Cyprus is four and Solana is just about, oh, she's just turned three actually. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a very amazing community uh, to be able to witness children in a teepee. And while medicine is getting passed around and it's conducted, obviously if anyone's been in a peyote ceremony with um, the native American church and the Lakota tradition, uh, it's very structured. Uh, there's no, you know, running around and getting up and leaving the teepee to go stretch and get some fresh air and go pee and all the things. But um, children in the teepee is just, a, it's just a magical um, occurrence. So it's uh, wonderful to hear you're doing the same with all kinds of other medicines too. So, yeah. 
Yeah, we generally hold uh, mushroom sits and sometimes those sits also include cacao or MDMA and, um, you know, we'll do maybe more than one night or a single night. And I find that, um, yeah, the children are very much there. We usually sit with children in arms. Toddlers are a little bit different, um, especially in the presence of um, psilocybin. There is a lot of it's a different kind of medicine. And so um, usually my son is present for like just leading up to drinking. And then he comes in in the morning for integration and helps us with integration. And yeah, he's aware of what the rattles are for and like how the feathers are helpful for people. And, you know, he has language around how is ceremony and you know he's he's really tertiary the experience and yeah to be truthful and honest i think a lot of parents also struggle with um those shared values among all the community members you know like the way one person parents is the way that is a different way than another person parents and in my own relationship now um my yeah my fiance and my son's father is not really down for Martin to start eating mushrooms yet. And um, at this age, he would be ready to begin his journey with them. And so I think there are some real like cross cultural implications too. And something I even found with some friends in the peyote church and the Native American churches, sometimes the mother and the father would feel like called to bring their children to meeting. And this was like all kosher and good. And then if the family broke up or if the mother left the father, sometimes those uh, the knowledge of the children being involved in ceremony would be like used against the mother, for example, to keep her away from her children. So this is also like a very real thing that a lot of us are, you know, dealing with with our within our own communities is um, like cross cultural or um, like inter interracial relations where cultural standards are really different. And so I noticed a lot of folks in here um, are like European and you know the tribes of europe were lost long ago and some of the entheogenic family practices of european folks aren't as um like present and maintained today uh, because of assimilation to american culture and they might look at you or the people that you're friends with and me and my people and see that oh you bring your kids to ceremony that's like so dangerous like how could you do that or why would you do that and um, I'm glad that you have a really beautiful perspective because actually watching it happen, you can really see how safe the children are and you can see how safe and adored and loved the experiences are and can be and how attuned that these kids really are born as. And so um, thank you for sharing your story because I think that's part of the frontier that we're on and part of um, trying to reestablish um, the cultural context for entheogens because yeah, everyone's ready to talk about a microdosing mom, but not a lot of people are ready to talk about children at ceremony yet.